lot of information, but it conveys some information, and so that becomes another choice. So they're not all equal. All the arcs aren't equal, so there's weighted arcs here. So the whole idea then of this information flow analysis, suppose my, my question is I have domains A and domain B, and I want to make sure that no data moves from domain A to domain B. So you start doing analysis, and what we do at Trace is we have this tool called APOL. It's open source, it's available on our website. Um, it loads in the SE Linux policy, and you can put in a goal in it. I have domain A, and I have domain B. Let me know, do an information flow analysis to tell me how many paths there are between A and B. And since they all have, it's an operating system, right? And they all have shared resources. They all depend on the operating system, or they'll depend on uh, <clears throat> any number of other factors. You'll get flows. And now you have to look at all those flows and determine, is this an operating system component that's trusted, or because it has to be trusted? Or is this a small program that I can eliminate? And so it becomes, it sort of becomes this game of looking at all the nodes and finding out which node can I eliminate or rearrange the graph so I can get rid of it. Um, you'll look at things like, is each link necessary? Does this program really need to access that resource? A lot of, um, when you look at SE Linux, and this is the, the philosophy that Red Hat is using, uh, and, it's, and it's a great idea because to get people to use type enforcement, the system has to work. So they're starting out with a policy that's not a least privileged policy, but it's a policy that works. It has much larger granularity, but it gets people started using SE Linux, and then they can basically shrink wrap it with, you know, put a hot blow gun on it and like sort of shrink wrap it, the security policy down to its least privileged policy. That's their plan. But if you go into an existing system, the number of links is, is it's, it's sort of overwhelming. And so you have to look at, you know, you'll have a program like SendMail touching things like the web server. Why is it doing that? Or it's touching, it has the ability to write, uh, you know, configuration files for maybe the X server. And you're, it's, it doesn't make any sense, but that's in the policy. And so you have to say, well, I can take that out. And so then you have to, that's the kind of analysis you're doing. And so then basically you're basically trying to eliminate these links. Another approach is you say, well, this is a link, but it's not a high value link. Maybe the, all they can do is they can, uh, they can see files that appear in this directory. The files only appear in the directory when something else happens that's beyond the user control. I'll live with that. I mean, because again, it gets down to these economic issues. Maybe I can fix it, but it's, I'm gonna have to write a new software package. I'm gonna have to take like SendMail and bust it up like into QMail. That's a lot of work. And so maybe I can't do that for this run. So you, you find other things. Other things is you might find like, well, in this flow, you know, maybe A, D, and I, you know, they're untrusted programs, large programs, send mail. But C is a small program, and it's, it's already trusted. I had to trust it for something else. So that's okay then. So this flow that exists between A and B is okay because C is a trusted program, and you know it's not going to violate your goal. And other, other things you can do is you can re-architect the system. You could use those sub-roles I talked about, uh, subdomains, to shift things around so uh, they don't apply... Um, so that the flows don't happen. So in, in the end, then it becomes this, the information flow analysis becomes looking, looking at the graph. Now in APOL, the APOL tool, you don't actually get a graph. You get a list of domains, basically with little arrows, hooking all the domains in a chain. And each arrow is basically telling you what the access is. This domain can read write this file that this domain can then read. And then so you have to follow this chain of reasoning. So it becomes a complex analysis task. And we're trying to, um, improve it, but it basically gets down to you have a very nasty graph and you have to look at it. And you have to check and make and basically use these tricks that I've talked about to get rid of it. So, so now this is just a list of things that you have to look at that maybe wasn't totally obvious to you. As I talked about in the beginning, you have you, you set up your security goals and those are basically like your software design goals that you're trying to, to satisfy. So you have to obviously check those goals. But, and one of the things that will fall out of that, well, here are the programs that are trusted. Here's a labeler program. You know, here's the file system. I've got to trust that. Maybe I'm stuck with SendMail. I've got to, I got to trust that. So that's, that's in here. And then you have to then say, OK, well, if it's a trusted program, then I have to make sure I, I know what that executable is. And then you know, maybe I can't even analyze it. Maybe for economic reasons, I can't analyze the program. I still want to make sure that nobody else can modify that executable or change it or change its shared libraries that it uses or, or anything like that. So you have to do that. Another problem you'll see is that this is a trusted program. 
it can execute shell scripts. So it can then run interpreted code. That's another bad thing. You don't want trusted programs being able to run interpreted code. You only want them to run well-defined code. So um, there's another thing I, I sort of glossed over about uh, SE Linux, and that's because SE Linux sits on top of regular Linux. So what happens is you can turn an, a regular Linux system in to an SE Linux system, but you have to all of a sudden label all these files. And so there's this file called the context file, which basically has a path name. It says for anything in this path name, give it this type of data. And it, it's done on boot up, and you can configure it so it does it every boot up, or once you get to a secure state, you don't have to do this every time. Um, but that's a very important. That becomes part of your analysis. Because I've, if I've done all this analysis on the type enforcement policy, I have to make sure it actually maps the actual files in the system correctly. And so you've got to get your, your file context file correct. Um, there's another one I only glossed on, a very powerful permission that's in SC Linux, which is the relabel permission. It allows you to relabel a type, change it from one type to another type. Now, you think, well, that's a, that, maybe that's too powerful. We shouldn't have that. Well, in reality, you'll have things like... Uh, um, the system when you're logging in, right? That's owned by the, the, the login prompt is owned by the system. But once you type in and log in your password, it's authenticated for you now. Now it w should be running in your name. So now you have to change, transition the type into your user type. So it's, it's something that's very what much needed, but it's a very powerful thing. So that has to be analyzed, making sure that nobody can change any types that would surprise anyone. And of course, then again, who can change the policy? The best systems I like are the ones where it's static from boot up and nobody can change the policy where the system is running. You take the system down in sort of administrative mode where you've cut off network access and then you can change the policy and you bring it back up in uh, normal mode. Not, not all systems can handle that and maybe that's a bit paranoid, but that's who I am. Um, you be in security for a while, you become really paranoid. You know, you get an email, you look twice. Does that person really love me? I don't think so. So, okay, so that covers basically the security goals section. Then you've got the analysis section. The third phase was this testing section. And security testing is just like software testing. As, as I've said, the security policy is almost as complex as software. Once the system is done, say I've tightened down, I thought, oh, SendMail doesn't need all this access. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got rid of a bunch of access for SendMail. This is good. Now a SendMail will be much more secure. You have to go run the system. SendMail may not run anymore because it actually needs those resources that you thought it didn't need. And that's a surprising thing you'll find over and over again. Um, not on SendMail, but on, on the web server, you know, or there'll be some bizarre feature that's rarely used. But once it's used and that user doesn't, can't use it anymore, they're going to come looking to you to fix the problem. So you have to do a bunch of security testing. It's, and it's much, ideally, you'd like to do total regression testing where you execute each line of code because then you would know that each uh, resource that the program would have access has been accessed and you know it has access and it's got the right access and that kind of stuff. Obviously very expensive and not something you want to be able to do. I'm going to have to, I'm going to step it up here. Um, DARPA has a very interesting program that's, that's like, like the SETI program where they're looking for signals from space where basically they're going to divide up the problem where people analyze and watch a program to see what resources it needs, and then people are going to compare lists. So they can build up a complete list of what resources a program needs. So basically, security testing is going to cover architectural flaws, things you didn't realize. <laughs> you're going to cry when you find them because you're going to have to go back and do a bunch more analysis. But you also find coding flaws, and you can, and you can move forward fixing those coding flaws. It's, it's just a, a necessary evil, just like software testing. Um, so the big thing is, unlike software, where you have to do a whole bunch of coding, which is much more time intensive. If you can fix the problem with security policy, it's much more economical. You can get it done a lot faster because you'll have, you, you can make maybe one line change in the policy file and now that program is constrained and it can't take an, ex maybe there's a code exploit where um, somebody can write a config file and they're overwriting, they're doing a buffer overflow and they're being able to ability to write a config file. Well, if you take the ability for the program to write the config file away, even though the buffer overflow stack is there and you haven't fixed it, they still can't write that config file and you've shut down the avenue much more economically. Um, 